We're going to have a look at what it means to be paralyzed and the journey to try and find a cure for a spinal cord injury. Uh, we are here, of course, because of Mark Pollock, explorer and motivational speaker. Um, he's the man you saw in the video. We will be speaking to people from all fields, from the uh, train, personal training side, from robotics, and uh, of course, from molecular biology side. All of these disciplines working to try to find a cure for paralysis. But we'll start off by introducing Mark Pollock. Perhaps, Mark, you might start off by explaining, as you have so many times on so many channels, um, how you got here uh, today. Wait, is I can stop going on about myself? No! <laughs> um, yeah, it was uh, well, coming on for th just over three and a half years ago. I fell from a second story window, hit the concrete below. I don't know what happened next. I just uh, have heard from some of the people who found me that uh, they thought I was dead, they saved my life. The, the doctors in intensive care, the nurses in intensive care um, predicted c that I was going to die. Whenever I worked out what was going on, uh, I wondered whether dying would have been a better outcome because I lay in intensive care high on morphine uh, with a fractured skull, bleeds in my brain, massive internal injuries, broken bones, uh, Paralyzed, and he, from those very early moments, I knew that paralyzed people had no hope of recovery. It's why I picked Christopher Reeve's chair. Christopher Reeve wasn't widely embraced by the um, by people in wheelchairs. Whenever he said that he dreamed of a world of empty wheelchairs, he he got a lot of uh, pushback on that. Um, because it people were offended. The, people the, were offended. The people who were going to spend the rest of their life in wheelchairs were, were, felt yeah. that he was looking down at them. Yeah, and that the wheelchair for some people, well, for all of us in wheelchairs, is an enabler. But you know, he was he was a pioneer. He was inspiring. He wanted to get out of his wheelchair. Um, now he didn't he didn't achieve his dream uh, for a whole host of different reasons. And the chair that uh, that is in this science gallery making its international debut without Christopher Reeve is in, is in the Science Gallery here today and it represents for me the failure of the system, the people within the system, all of us, uh, to find a cure for spinal cord injury and, and he died, yet his legacy lives on in his foundation, in the people who are there and for me at, en at any rate provided the hope whenever I was flat out in hospital for 18 months that, that maybe it could be different. One of the most serendipitous things that happened, sadly, was Christopher Reed's spinal cord injury because he was a celebrity and um, we were very fortunate in that he decided to use that celebrity to advantage of anyone living with a spinal cord injury and those scientists who were working in the field and he really I think was the first person who put a human face on spinal cord injury. He was very smart and he, um, he appreciated the science. He understood how difficult it was, but he also understood the enormous promise that um, it holds. It's about the organization and the collaboration and uh, you know, the power of one. Someone like uh, Christopher Reeve could do huge things. My, uh, Michael J. Fox could do uh, great things, but you don't, you don't have to be famous to do great things. I think, uh, I think people with injuries, the foundations, the scientists, like all of these people are all working on the same, the same area, but we need, to, we need to organize and coordinate a little, a little bit better. As we think about what a cure might look like, I think that it's safe to say that the experts, the clinicians, the scientists would all agree, and probably most of the patients themselves, that there's not ever going to be a single cure. Um, there are going to be combinations of interventions that promote different recoveries after injury. Simon, um, you're, uh, I suppose you've been here as 
Mark's prosthesis in some way to, uh, when we were talking about training. Talk to us a little bit about your role, what you've been doing for Mark and Project Walk. The research in this area is, is at a very early stage um, and particularly as larger therapy institutions such as Project Walk grow, um, the research is going to get stronger and exactly how these, these aggressive physical therapy um, systems can, can benefit. Um, and I suppose the second element of it then is, is um, throughout the training there's an attempt to, to encourage some kind of plasticity in the central nervous system. There's an attempt to reconnect uh, the brain with the legs through the injury side almost. So as Mark uh, attempts to lift his knee to his chest, he'll, he'll attempt that, he'll think it, and then I, he wouldn't be able to do it, but I would move his knee towards his chest. And the idea being that through repetition, that there might be some kind of rewiring of the neural network. Um, and he's thinking and I'm moving and then the top connects back down with the bottom and um, there might be some kind of uh, return of, of function. So I've got motors at the sensors all over the feet, multiple sensors in the feet. Um, motors at the, at the motors and sensors at the knees and at the hips. I'll press a button here on the on the right hand. I'll move over to the left. Uh, press a button and, uh, and away we'll go. Okay, ready and yeah. And a bit left. This this technology actually started. Um, as a DARPA program, which is the U.S.'s advanced research for, for uh, uh, defense products. And at the time, we were trying to make exoskeletons to prevent injuries to soldiers. My brother was a, a, a Navy SEAL at the time, and we had made a deal when we were kids that he'd be a Navy SEAL, I'd be an engineer, and someday I'd figure out a way to make him cool stuff. And unfortunately, three weeks into it, he actually had an accident and broke his neck. He's a C6, C7 incomplete. And that was my first exposure to, to a spinal cord injury. And I remember flying across the country thinking, okay, well, we can apply exoskeleton technology to help, to help people walk again. And I got there and it was really interesting because my brother lost all the use of his arms. He, he never lost the ability to walk. And over the course of, I, I'd say it took him about two and a half years, he's actually recovered all of that strength and can do 20 pull-ups again and is in great shape. And, and what stuck in, in our minds was he was able to do that because he could he could gradually dial up the, the rehabilitation, starting with really small objects and working up to bigger and bigger tasks as his muscles got stronger until he, he, you know, he could do pull-ups and push-ups again. And the question in our mind was, how do you do that if you've lost the ability to walk? How do you gradually start walking again? Even if you have 5% or 10% of your muscle strength, you really need an exoskeleton to support that differential to replace the, the lost muscle and let the the users actually walk and as they recover, um, you know, we thought use that exoskeleton to fill in the deficiencies and as the, the, the user gets stronger, the exo can get weaker and eventually they, they wouldn't need it. That was our, our early goal and kind of what got us um, going down the medical path. Myself and Mark uh, both uh, have trained under a guy called Andy Galbraith out in uh, Cambridge and um, just when you mentioned that you did uh, 200 steps in the first couple of hours, he um, he asked me just to mention to you that uh, that I did 548. <laughs> Why is it so difficult to repair a spinal injury? Yeah, boy, that's a good question. So there, there are actually built into the adult system inherent um, barriers to spontaneous repair. And this is probably a function of Mother Nature being very, very elegant. Um, but one of the seminal discoveries that was made in the field back, back in the... Um, mid-80s was the um, presence of inhibitory proteins in the adult brain and spinal cord. And these proteins um, literally um, work against any kind of spontaneous repair. Um, there is a scar that forms at the lesion site that's highly inhibitory. For a very long time, scientists thought that the reason that the spinal cord 
could not be repaired was due to the absence of something, probably nerve growth factors like um, uh, fertilizer for nerve cells. And um, that's partly true. But nobody until this serendipitous finding by Martin Schwab um, at the University of Zurich, no one was thinking that one of the reasons that the spinal cord couldn't repair itself was because of the actual presence of something. More recently, some very exciting new threads have, have begun to emerge. This notion that the brain and spinal cord are plastic, that they have the capacity to reorganize, to change after injury and after disease, and that they can actually, um, there are things that can be done so that the brain and spinal cord become active promoters of recovery. When you have a spinal cord injury, as devastating as it is, it turns out you don't really injure a high number of neurons. You just injure those in most cases that are connecting the brain to the spinal cord. And so in a sense, we work around that and we've been doing two things. One is activating the system, taking the things that the brain did, which is not fine control, and um, replacing that with some generalized stimulation. So the spinal cord can do all of its sophisticated control like it did before the injury. And the second is to amplify any of the residual fibers that may cross the lesion to help with um, movement that's intended. We have taken all of this knowledge and implanted stimulators at the lo lower part of the spinal cord um, to test this theory, and it turns out that, it, that it, it's worked pretty well. These people who were completely paralyzed before the stimulator can stand without any physical assistance when the stimulator's on and can also move their toes, ankles, knees, hips, um, not like they did before the injury, but the fact that they can do it at all is, is a great um, step forward, if you will. Rob Summers, who's one of the four uh, patients you're treating, regained some sexual and bladder function. He can also move his toes, ankles, knees, and hips on command. Is that right? That is right. It's very important that the research community interfaces with people who are affected and understand and connect with the desperation sometimes there is to find a cure. Most people talk about supporting us because they hope for a cure, perhaps not for themselves, but for the next generation of people who are injured. So actually, you know, I don't come up against desperate, desperate frustration actually very often at all. Most people on an intellectual level understand that the research is being done, but the fact is it takes a lot of money um, and time. I knew that paralysed people had no hope of recovery, and suddenly I was one of those people, someone with, with no hope, um, physically no hope of recovery, because there are no therapies, uh, there are no cures. I don't think anyone in this exhibition, the Ranulph Fines of the world, the Sonia Sullivans, the uh, Dysons of this world, I don't think they would have done any of the things that they did without, um, without hope.